it ten seconds and try to give me a, you know, a as calm as you can, whatever you know. Right. Okay. Right. This is Sid Davis, and I'm at the Dallas Trademark, where President Kennedy was to make a major address this afternoon. The word is now being passed throughout the House that President Kennedy has been shot and has been taken to the Parkland Hospital near here. The only information we have at the present time is that the President was fired upon as his car approached a cloverleaf to go onto a freeway to come to the Dallas trademark for his speech. According to reporters who were closer to the president, Mrs. Kennedy is supposed to have said, my God. The reporters did notice that the president's body did fall limp. Governor John Connolly of Texas and the president are in the hospital. Their conditions at this moment are unknown. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas, from the, this is Sid Dallas. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas trademark in Dallas, Texas. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas Trademark, a gigantic and beautiful building for public exhibitions, where the word is just now being passed to several hundred persons sitting at their noon luncheon table that President Kennedy has been shot. We have no information on the President's condition. We do know that he has been taken, along with Governor John Connolly of Texas, to the hospital nearby. The president arrived in Dallas a short while before the incident took place. There were large and happy crowds on the street. It was a clear day, the sun shining, not a cloud in the sky. There were several hundreds of thousands of persons that lined the streets from the airport to where the incident took place. Crowds were very thick during the noon hour downtown. The shooting took place at about 12.30 as the president's open convertible with Mrs. Kennedy sitting next to him approached a cloverleaf going onto a freeway that would eventually take him to the trademark. We noticed, riding behind the president, that suddenly the president's car sped ahead with a tremendous burst of speed. Then Secret Service men began to run. By then the car was out of sight. We could not see it. But local policemen started running over a hill toward the cloverleaf and up onto a railroad track trestle that crosses over that superhighway. We have arrived at the trademark now. We are awaiting word from the hospital on the president's condition. At the moment, we have no additional information. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas trademark in Dallas, Texas. Hello. Sid, stand by a second. What do you hear? Sid? Just a minute. Jim Snyder here. I'm going to ask Sid Davis some questions in Dallas, Texas. Okay, Jim, turn your uh, monitor down just a little bit more. You'll still be able to hear Sid. And the president. Okay, Charlie, I turned it down. Say something. Okay, I'm talking to you. Okay. Okay. Sid? Yes? Okay, you and Jim are set to go for recording for a two-way. All right. Uh, let me I... get the whole button on my phone and you're on, the, on your way. All right. Sid, can you give us as complete a description as you can of the events leading up to the attempt on the president's life. Uh, yeah. Hello, Sid. Hello, Sid. Sid. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jim's apparently not talking to you on the phone also. Jim, he's on the beat line. I can't feed into the beat line. I don't hear okay. anything, Okay, all right, Charlie, I goofed. I didn't pick up the phone. I'm sorry. All right, Sid, I'm going to start right now. All right, go. Sid, can you give us as completely as possible a rundown on the events that led up to the attempt on the president's life? Well, Jim, we're coming in from Love Field in Dallas. There was a very warm reception out there, about three or 4,000 people, mostly young people, uh, cheering and very enthusiastic over the president and Mrs. Kennedy's arrival. And Mrs. Kennedy and the president walked over to shake hands uh, with uh, these people in the crowd. Most of them were young people. Then the motorcade proceeded into Dallas. For a, it's about a 12-mile ride into Dallas, and it took about 30 minutes. And as we got closer into town, the crowd uh, became very large and uh, very warm and friendly. They were not wildly cheering, but they were enthusiastic. And there were very few, if any, heckling-type 
of signs. Uh, most of the signs welcome the president. We got through town, and as we were leaving the end of the downtown section, heading toward an approach onto a freeway, this is sort of a cloverleaf, we were on the press bus, uh, I would say about 10 cars behind the president. We noticed a sudden burst of speed on the president's car. Uh, the car just shot forward, and the local policeman who had been standing guard along the route then started to run. And one reporter uh, said that he heard three shots being fired, but we were not sure that they might have been a car backfiring. But suddenly we noticed local police running to the top of this cloverleaf where a railroad trestle appears to pass. The president's car was going under this overpass at the time. What kind of a car was the president riding in? He was riding in an, his open uh, midnight blue Lincoln Continental convertible. Mrs. Kennedy was with him along with Governor Conley and Mrs. Conley. That's the bubble top car. Right, this is the bubble top that carries a plexiglass top. Jim, I'm standing in the trademark where the president was supposed to speak and announcements are now being made of the people. Uh, a hush went through this crowd here when they first learned the president had been shot, and I just noticed a man walking by me with his wife. His wife was limp, hearing the news that the president had been shot. He was escorting her out of the building. She was very pale. Just a, just a, a man and woman who live here in Dallas. The announcement is now being made to the people from the podium, and I'm trying to pick that up. Stand by. The music has stopped. They were playing an organ uh, during a, this luncheon program. The president was to deliver a luncheon speech before a group of businessmen, some people who study here at the Advanced Research Institute, and some civic leaders. But now that the, now that the announcement has been made, the music has stopped here in the hall. No one is saying a word. People are starting to filter out very quietly. Some are coming over here near the telephones to find out if anyone has any word on the condition of the president and Governor Connolly as well as their wives. Sid, have you been able to talk to anyone who was uh, fairly close to the uh, scene and what well, happened? We, to the we, were, we were, I would say, on the press bus, uh, about 10 cars behind, and then they have your pool reporters, those reporters who are able to ride a little forward of us, who reported hearing three shots, and uh, they have practically confirmed now that there were three shots being fired as if uh, they came from a, an automatic type of weapon. Did the president collapse in the car or what? Well, as we understand it, the president fell forward, and so did Governor Connolly, and we were also told that uh, bullet uh, marks or wounds were visible on the white shirt of Governor Connolly on his chest. Uh, this is what we've been told so far. Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly are, are at the hospital. It's about five minutes uh, from the trademark. Were, they, were Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Uh, Connolly in the same car with the president yes, and the were. governor? I, yes, I mentioned that, and they did not appear to be hit, although we, do, we are not at this moment sure of anything because uh, uh, almost a complete chaos has now taken place. The White House staff people are trying to arrange uh, uh, press tables, telephones, etc., to get the story out. And uh, the emergency room here, as you know, is being is very busy. Is there any? What is the latest word you have heard on the president's condition? We have we have only the word that the president has been shot. This is all uh, the information we have at the present time. The president's car, after this incident took place, just shot forward in a tremendous burst and headed right for the hospital. It passed the trademark completely by, and this is the, wor this is the first indication we got uh, that something serious, actually serious, had happened. When the shooting took place, Sid, was the president's car just cruising along where the Secret Service men oh, running yeah. along beside yes. it as they usually do? That's right. The Secret Service, uh, there was a Secret Service car. We call that the Queen Mary. It follows the president's car immediately behind. It's a great big, large Cadillac uh, convertible, about 10 or 12 years old, and Secret Service men ride its running boards. It has running boards. There are Secret Service men on, alongside the running boards and inside the car. And uh, these men, of course, are helpless when you have a sniper-type uh, situation, as we did have today. Uh, in that uh, Secret Service car, they carry a Tommy gun that is a rapid-fire repeating type of weapon. And I've seen it many times being placed in the car when we get off the president's plane. It's, uh, it's carried in a black bag, but apparently this time they never got a chance to use the automatic weapon. It uh, is usually on the floor in the rear seat of the uh, Queen Mary as the Secret Service follow the president. Okay, Sid, well, you're on your way to the hospital now, right? I'm on the way to the hospital now, Jim. We'll try to keep you posted. Thank you very much. Everyone in Washington, like Americans everywhere, is stunned by the news of the assassination attempt on President Kennedy this afternoon in Dallas. When the news came, the House was adjourned, but the Senate was in session debating a bill. Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was called to a Senate cloakroom telephone and told the news. Mansfield paused and said, 
This is terrible. I can't find words. Senate Minority Leader Dirksen was then called to the phone, and when he, he heard the news, he said, Oh, God, this is the most distressing thing that could ever happen. I am shocked. On a motion by Mansfield, the Senate recessed at 1.55 p.m. to wait for further developments in the presidential shooting. Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon told the Senate just before it recessed, after hearing the tragic news, that if ever there was an hour to pray, this is the hour all Americans should. During the quorum call, Mansfield and Dirksen went to the Senate Democratic cloakroom, apparently to call the White House. Senators who had watched the news tickers off the Senate chamber drifted onto the floor and huddled in groups talking. Jim Snyder, Washington. The Vice President has gone into seclusion. There is no information as yet as to whether he has taken the oath or on arrangements for the presidential vote for Vice President Lyndon Johnson who was also not wounded. Here at the hospital, groups of people stand by outside, young girls who two hours ago were cheering wildly the arrival of the young president and his stunning wife, are now wiping tears from their eyes. People are walking through the hospital corridors here in disbelief. It's hard to believe you hear the word, oh dear, spoken so many times. A few minutes ago, Father Oscar Huber, the pastor of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church, in which this hospital, and with whose parish this hospital is located, administered to the president the last rite. There are several clergymen, Catholic clergymen, in the building. The president did receive the last rites of the church. We do not know whether the last rite came prior to his death. We do not have information here at the hospital because of the chaotic situation and the shock of this whole tragic incident on whether the assassin has been apprehended. We, we understand that the shock that took the president's life came from a building downtown known as the State Book Depository Building the Secret Service men were seen gathered around there. I talked to a young man, Charles Hodge, 17 years old, who was a senior in high school here in Dallas, and he was taking pictures of the motorcade as it rounded the, the cloverleaf to head onto the freeway where the incident took place. And he said that he saw Mrs. Kennedy lean over the president and saw Governor Connolly slump in the seat of their open Lincoln Continental Convertible. This whole incident has been very tragic. Ironically, it comes at a time when uh, the president was about to address a group of civic fathers here in Dallas. The incident also follows a rather embarrassing situation of a month ago when UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson was not only struck with a placard by a demonstrator, but was also spat upon. Now, in the motorcade, Sid, when the shooting took place, Mr. Johnson was in the car behind President Kennedy, as we understand That's it. That's right. He was in the car behind the President, and uh, was not, uh, could not have been hit could be, uh, if there was not a spray. Uh, Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who was also two cars behind the President, uh, told me when I asked him what he saw, he said, it's too horrible to describe they were seriously hurt. This is, of course, before we have been informed that the president is dead. Well, now, the president was shot when? About 12.30 Dallas time? That's right. But it would have been 1.30 your time. The shooting incident took place at about 12.30 Dallas time during the noon hour after coming through the downtown section. It was a brilliant sunny day, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people turned out. And we were taking notes on the bus about the crowd and the welcome some of the signs in politics that were not so welcome. But it was a cheerful crowd, an enthusiastic crowd, and they were happy to see the president of Mrs. Kennedy. She was dressed in a sort of a raspberry-colored uh, two-piece suit, as I recall, and uh, her traditional pillbox hat. And the president had on his blue pinstripe, which he is so fond of and wears many times in Washington. And uh, he, he was seen to slump over the seat. Mrs. Kennedy then tried to grasp him and grab him, and we were told from perhaps a Secret Service man, second hand, that he said, oh my, 
my God, he's been shot. But we don't have that official. No one has yet can verify those words. It's too early. Well, part of this tragedy is that the Kennedy visit to Texas was going very well. It was it had been a happy affair. The president uh, spoke this morning outside the hotel in Fort Worth and was in good humor. Absolutely, Jim. Uh, he was in tremendous spirits this morning and all through the trip, and both he and Jackie seemed to be enjoying themselves. I rode with the president last night. I was on the president's plane last night uh, coming into Fort Worth, and it was about midnight, and he seemed to be in very good spirits. It's been a tremendously trying day for him. Uh, he came into the cabin. He came into the uh, forward cabin of the plane where the reporters sit. And he smiled and walked back into his cabin. And Mr. Kennedy did the same. It's just they just came in briefly and then they retired to the presidential suite, which is in the rear of the Air Force One, which is the president's plane. But they were in tremendous spirits last night. And then this morning, the president was up early to talk to a group of people outside the <coughs> excuse me outside the hotel uh, in the. Uh, parking lot and uh, Fort Worth uh, was very warm to him and he was happy and it was only an 8 minute flight from Fort Worth to Dallas and it was only a 45 minutes or so after we had gotten into Dallas that this took place the commotion you hear in the background if at all you can hear it uh, are additional telephones now being brought in for emergency press rooms that are being set up the telephones in the hospital are at a premium and uh, we're fortunate to have commandeered this one although there are many people standing in line where are you exactly in the hospital? It's, it's, uh, what you might call the administrator's office, right uh, near the press room. I am uh, probably uh, 30 uh, yards or so from the emergency uh, entrance where the president's body is or was at the last time I, I had checked. Well, from the time sequence, Sid, he was shot at 12.30 Dallas time and died at 1 p.m., he really could not have lived very long once he arrived at the hospital. No, so he was mortally wounded. Uh, he lived about a half hour, and uh, the word that we had gotten at first was that, uh, that the top surgeons, neuro neurological surgeons from around the country were being alerted, but it was too late. The president was fatally injured, and uh, there was no, no chance, apparently, to save him. Uh, the hospital is only four blocks from where he was to speak, so getting to the hospital was not the problem. The president, uh, the sniper's bullet had hit a very fine mark. Uh, as I said, and I would like to repeat, uh, the very terse announcement, which will now, of course, become uh, part of history. Uh, the announcement, as read, <coughs> pardon me, as read to us, is that John F. Kennedy died at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time today in Dallas from a gunshot wound in the brain. And that was the extent of the announcement? We have no information on the assassination of the, the assassin. That was the extent of the announcement, and then the questions followed. The questions asking, where is the vice president, who is now, of course, the president? When will he take his oath? Where is Mrs. Kennedy? What will she do? And the answers to those questions are that Mr. Kennedy will return to Washington. The Vice President is at a location which the Secret Service will not disclose at this time, and that Governor Connolly, who was also hit, is in satisfactory position. This, uh, this whole trip uh, has been very strange. The reporters sometimes are allowed to have premonitions. And I didn't have any, so I will not say that I did. But when you are riding a press bus or when you are riding behind the president, uh, as often as we have in our bureau, I think uh, many times you think how easy it is if someone, if someone really wants to kill someone, it is not a very difficult job. And uh, there are many buildings, high buildings, places where people can hide, and it is impossible to get enough policemen or enough secret servicemen watch everybody and uh, we have lost other presidents in our history and John F. Kennedy uh, is one of the one of those victims he died in uh, about the thousandth day of his administration he was about to speak in Dallas to a large group of people about the, some of the accomplishments of the new administration some of the goals this country must reach in uh, the next 10 or so years President uh, 
was a man, I believe, uh, watching him, who had a great sense of, of history. He loved the military. He loved pump, the military band, music. We stopped the motorcade as he did here today, shortly before his death, to shake a few hands, to chat with some people and say, how are you? We'll talk to them. Mrs. Kennedy seems to be enjoying herself. Uh, it, is a, it is a shock. I, I believe that I, I think even the most hardened reporter, and I don't think there uh, are many, uh, would, would not be moved by the loss of the president of this country. And to my own personal feelings, if uh, I might impose on you and uh, those people listening, are that it is a very tragic day for this country. And uh, it is uh, also very hard to talk about it. Uh, I was perhaps 10 vehicles behind the president's car with the rest of the White House press. And uh, we noticed the motion up ahead, but the president's car had gone around the bend. We noticed that there was a sudden surge in speed in the president's car, and police began running. And then we knew something had happened. And, uh, we started to recall sound, and there was the sound of perhaps one, two, or three shots. Now that we are we are told that probably were three shots indicating that a repeater weapon might have been fired. Did the thought thought go through your mind at that time, Sid, that there might have been an assassination attempt? At the moment, not right away, because the president uh, has a habit of wanting to stop his car, and so the Secret Service will always rush forward uh, to go to go to the car and uh, protect him and Mr. Kennedy if, if the crowd is too rowdy. At that moment, no, and then all of a sudden, I think in unison, everybody felt that something terrible had happened. And we were on a big bus and, uh, uh, with 50 or so White House reporters and trying to get the bus driver to move faster. We couldn't. The bus just wouldn't go faster. And we, uh, we noticed that the president's car had left the motorcade on the way to the trademark where he was supposed to speak. And we pulled into the trademark minus the president's car, which was even more suspicious. Then we knew something happened. And then you can imagine 50 reporters charging through this hall and perhaps a thousand to two thousand people gathered in a luncheon table set and white tablecloths and silverware and dinnerware uh, waiting for the president's arrival and an organ playing and these reporters running like a herd through the hall saying what happened uh, let's try to find out where the president's car disappeared to and then the first words start coming back from those who might have been closer to the officials in cars closer that the president was shot the governor was shot and the hush went through the hall at that time. But the music played because most of the people did not know at that time that's what had happened. And people talked to each other, uh, and you could see them. And I, I noticed several women walking out limp, leaning on their husbands in the court, not, not able to believe what they had been told. It was very hard for us to believe it. We had seen this man in many motorcades uh, in Costa Rica, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, in Bermuda, in Nassau. Uh, and where crowds might have been perhaps somewhat more hostile than, than they are at home. But this was not a hostile crowd today. It was an enthusiastic one. It was friendly. Did you see any uh, very unfriendly signs in the crowd? There were, there were a couple. One said Goldwater for president. It's a traditional all over the country whenever you're coming into a presidential year. The men who are mentioned as possible contenders are all, always have supporters. Uh, someone said, I do not agree with your socialistic policies, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Dallas is, is the home of, of great Republican conservative strength, and it is not unusual for these many people here to have views op opposite presidents. Uh, there are there are uh, presidents of this town who perhaps are a little more vociferous, uh, a little more vehement, a little more volatile, as was uh, demonstrated when Adlai Stevenson was here uh, not many weeks ago and encountered some rather hostile people who chose to demonstrate physically rather than uh, with signs uh, passively. So, uh, yes, there were some signs, but there were some signs in San Antonio and some signs in Houston, and there are signs in New York. Uh, this is part of the great game of American politics. Apparently, uh, some twisted mind, uh, perhaps let some of this get go too far. Uh, so we have the tragedy we have today. This is all like, uh, this is a commentary, of course, but this is the best I can, uh, the best words I can use to describe uh, what has taken place in my own personal feelings. I feel compelled almost to interpret what I think happened. And 
downtown Dallas today. For, it will live for many, many years. There's no word yet on uh, when the president's body will be returned to Washington. No, this is, this is far too early. The president uh, uh, expired 55 minutes ago, Jim. And it is far too early uh, for us at this time to, to find out this information. Of course, it's very complex. Uh, the announcement to us, uh, as best I can recall, the announcement to us that the president was dead was made at uh, 1.35 Central Standard Time, 35 minutes afterward. And uh, Mr. Mr. Gildas, who made the announcement, could barely speak the word. They only have room for two pullers. For three pullers, and me and Chuck Roberts are going to have to flip to see who goes. Yeah. But Mrs. Kennedy is going back with it. Uh, now, should I flip them or stay here? Uh, stay there. In Dallas. Right. All right, then I'll tell Robert T. Just, just a minute, Sid. Once, Jim. Yeah, Sid, stay there. Jim? Yeah. Put this on the air. Do you have a line open? What do you got? The vice president will be sworn in just a few minutes. I believe it's going to take place right on the jet. Okay. Now, look, Sid, you, can you stand by there till I do an intro on the line? Uh, I don't have a hell of a lot of time. It'll have to be about a one-minute story. Okay, oh. hold on. Station, stand by. Jim Snyder will be coming up very, very quickly. Attention, Jim Snyder coming up very quickly. Mind you, only have a little bit of time. Give me a level, Sid. Give me a quick level. Hello, 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 hello. Give me a quick level. Okay, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. You've got 15 seconds to go, Sid. 15 right. seconds. Five seconds from... Do you hear that? Right. Okay, Sid. Go! This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas airport, where three hours ago the scene was gaiety as President and Mrs. Kennedy got off a glistening Air Force airplane to meet a crowd of well-wishers. Three hours later now, the scene is utter tragedy. Aboard the plane, in a bronze, solid bronze casket, is the President. And Mrs. Kennedy is aboard the plane, which will be departing for Washington very shortly with the President's body. White House staff people are also aboard. And we are told that the vice president will be sworn in as president within a few minutes. This is Sid Davis with this information from the Dallas airport in Dallas, Texas. Just moments ago, a plane left the Dallas airport carrying the body of the president and Mrs. Kennedy. We were informed by our correspondent, Sid Davis, who was in Dallas today with the president, that he is one of three reporters who have been chosen to ride on that plane back to Washington. They have already taken off by this time. The last opportunity I had to talk to Sid, he was not certain uh, on the whereabouts of Vice President Lyndon Johnson. However, there was a possibility that Mr. Johnson would be on that plane too. And because Malcolm Kilduff, the Assistant White House Press Secretary, had informed reporters that Mr. Johnson would be sworn in in a very short time. It raises the possibility that Mr. Johnson might be sworn in as the new president of the United States on that plane, making its very somber journey back to Washington. We just have a bulletin from the Associated Press that Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as president of the United States at about 1.38 p.m. Central Standard Time today. That would be 2.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The oath was administered by U.S. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. Now, the FBI, part of this story is what happens to the man who shot President Kennedy and wounded the governor of Texas today. As of this moment, he has not been apprehended. But you can be certain that one of the most intensive searches in the history of this country is being carried on at this moment to apprehend him. And you have details on that. Well, you can be sure, Jim, that the law enforcement 
agency of this government unmask are deri are taking every effort possible to find this assassin. Uh, Director J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI telephoned the Dallas FBI office and ordered them to conduct an all-out investigation of the uh, the murder and the attempt on the lives of others in the presidential party. We have word of the doctor's report from Dallas, the official doctor's report on exactly what happened to Mr. Kennedy. According to the United Press, President Kennedy was shot through the throat and head, possibly by the same bullet the attending surgeon said today. Dr. Malcolm Perry, 34 years old, said, there was an entrance wound below his Adam's apple. There was another wound in the back of his head. Two of the ten doctors in attendance on the president said it was possible that one bullet entered the throat and went through the back of the president's head. It was possible, they said, that he was hit by two bullets, but they doubted it. The president's throat <clears throat> was open to relieve breathing. Blood and fluids were administered intravenously. The doctors labored to keep respiration at a life-sustaining level. However, their labors were, of course, in vain, and they really didn't, they were working against time because the president was shot at 1230 Dallas time, and he died at 1 o'clock Dallas time. President John F. Kennedy is dead, and the people of Dallas are asking themselves why. It was a sniper's bullet that killed the president, while a crowd in the thousands welcomed him and his wife to town. But Dallas has a recent history of hostility toward members of the Kennedy administration. When Lyndon Johnson and his wife came campaigning in 1960, a rowdy group of Republicans roughed them up in a hotel lobby and held them in a corner. A few weeks ago, a woman demonstrator's placard struck Adlai Stevenson on the head, and another Stevenson critic spat in the ambassador's face. Today, as the presidential motorcade rode into town under a bright Texas sun and a blue sky, some might have recalled those incidents, but few here believe the tragedy that has come would happen. President Kennedy died of a bullet wound of the brain, said the terse announcement to reporters. Associate News Secretary Malcolm Kilduff couldn't hold back the tears when he announced, John F. Kennedy is dead. Fighting emotion, Kilduff, speaking from a hurriedly set up press room in Parkland Hospital, said, death came at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. One hour and 39 minutes later, the machinery of this government elevated Lyndon Johnson to the nation's highest office. It was a solemn, simple ceremony in the presidential compartment of Air Force One, the big plane that only three hours before had brought a smiling president and his wife to Dallas. There's very little more we can say in a manner of speaking, perhaps. John F. Kennedy has come home. Uh, I think one of the uh, things that might be appropriate at this time, he liked to quote from Robert Frost many times on the campaign, and but one of the president's favorite quotations, and I believe it went something like this, I have promises to keep and many miles to go before I sleep. And with that, this is Sid Davis reporting from the White House.